Hi, I'm Jason. Last week was a bit of an introduction to what I'm calling desert practices. And I invited you to send me some messages. What do you do in the midst of the desert? What do you do if you're feeling a bit disconnected and lonely? COVID-19 has us more separated than we prefer. So let's take a look at what healthy desert practices there are. I really enjoyed reading those messages and uh, from you about your desert practices and I'm planning on integrating it in to the teachings over the next several weeks. This morning, I wanted to take a look at one of the desert practices that we've seen in the history of the world, in the history of the church, but on a much more practical level. What are one of the things that you would do if you were actually in the desert? Well, one of the things is that you would look for shelter. And so this morning is a, a look at and hopefully an internal process for us of creating shelter for others or creating safe spaces, making safe spaces. These communities in the desert, these monasteries, if you look back at the history of desert dwelling people, there, and especially through the lens of the church, monasteries were built and these monasteries not the same thing as maybe uh, what you would think of as a modern church building monasteries were safe spaces designated for prayer yeah designated for worship definitely designated for study and for teaching for sure but also designated to be safe places for people as they were traveling through and journeying journeying through the desert they arrive at a monastery and it was known that they would be welcomed and they would be served and they would be loved and provided for there's actually an ancient expression that still is seen a lot in the world, and that is if, you, if you're traveling and you arrive at someone's home or someone's monastery, there's just so many things that would be done to take care of you. I don't know uh, if you've ever experienced anything like that, but when I've traveled around the world, it seems as if whenever I go on the other side of the world, even if it's not on the other side of the world, but when I go outside of the United States of America, it seems as if I am welcomed uh, in a way that kind of speaks to this. This I've been on a long journey and there's just complete hospitality. And one of the ancient expressions actually we see in the Bible of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. This washing of feet was, you know, you're on a long journey through the dust and the dirt and your feet are dirty. Uh, that's, that's an example of this, this hospitality creating a safe space hospitality speaks to just whatever is mine is yours uh, you're a visitor and you don't have to prove whether you belong in this tribe you don't have to prove anything you don't have to prove if you believe the same thing as me it's just simply that you are all, you were on a journey and you've arrived and so I will welcome you with open arms and I want to take a look at a couple passages there's a, there's a passage in numbers chapter 35 and also the same theme is mentioned in Deuteronomy 4. And you can look up Numbers 35, 9 through 28 and read that on your own. And maybe if you're in a spiritual formation group, you can, or just in a friend group, you can read that and talk together. And then Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 41 through 43. And also Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 1 through 13. But even if you don't turn there, just realize, uh, just picture this. I mean, picture this. Ancient time, desert area, kingdoms and tribes, in between those kingdoms, desert, wild place, wilderness. And there were these cities that were set up that God told the Israelites to set up these, these safe places, these places of refuge that were kind of a, asylums for people, these safe places. I always think of maybe like um, in some movies, like uh, if you go into a church building, the vampires can't get you. It's kind of like that. But in particular, it was safe places, cities set up as safe places, not just in general, but for those who had accidentally or unintentionally killed someone. It's a really distinct thing, right? And the reason that was, that was a need was because 
in that culture, there were these there were these people that sometimes are called blood avengers, these vigilantes of justice. So if there was an accidental death, not a purposeful murder, but an accidental death, there were people that would take the law into their own hands, and they were called blood avengers, those vigilantes that would that would kill people even if they didn't mean if if the person didn't mean to do it. And so God told the Israelites to set up these cities and actually mentioned six. And in rabbinic tradition, based on how the scripture reads, it kind of allows that there would, seems like there would, the implication is that there would be more and more of these built, more of these cities set up. And so these cities were set up to provide safe space, asylum, for people who had to leave their city that they lived in, leave their tribe, leave their community, because they were kind of on the run from a blood avenger. And the reason that that blood avenger was chasing after them was because they had accidentally killed someone. And so this might seem like some really archaic thing that might not have much life application now, uh, but I actually think it really, really does. And, and here's how. Remember the teaching when Jesus said, You've heard it been said, do not murder, but I tell you, if you have hatred in your heart for your brother, then you're already a murderer. And so you might not have set out and meant to kill someone, but I've done that. Now, I've never actually murdered anyone, but my heart has done that. And I didn't mean to, and I didn't want to, and I certainly didn't wake up and set out to but I became an accidental murderer. I accidentally have killed people in my heart. And that means that I need safe space. So it's hard and it's lonely to, to feel that feeling of killing and knowing that it was an accident and knowing that you are guilty, but you didn't really mean to do it. And when you kind of own that teaching of Jesus and you realize, wow, I need a city that would provide this asylum. I need an area, I need a safe place where where there can be people that would welcome me with open arms. I've done that, Have have you done that? Do you need safe space? I need safe space. And I think that the heart, church family, is meant to be one of these places, meant to be one of these spaces. Do you feel that? Do you believe that? Do you agree with me, sisters and brothers? I've talked to so many people over the years who there's been a sense of like, they, they didn't feel like they belonged in a tribe for whatever reason. And then they arrive, whether it be in a, in a living room or in an auditorium, and they feel a sense of safety. And I want to lean into that a little bit, but I, I want to talk about a statue that is at App State. It's a, it's a big piece of art. And I don't really know what the artist intended with it. That's kind of the nature of art. But it's what I interp- what I think I see is a church building and then at the base of that church building a big open hand. Do you know what I'm talking about? So you students or former students or, or faculty at App or maybe anyone who's just kind of walked around campus. It's, a, it's pretty much right in the center of campus. And that's what I see. I see a church building and then I see like this open hand. And at first, for a long time, for years, I kind of thought, well, maybe uh, that kind of represents, okay, so a place of worship, a faith community, a church building is this place that's, you know, there's this, welcome hand of the church and then everyone come and everyone is welcome here and i certainly i want to be like that and i know that a lot of other people want to be like that i would imagine that most churches would say that they want to be like that but i was wondering recently what that what that piece of art might possibly represent in the midst of a focus on on desert practice because people have left the church building. And so if it's just about going to church and there's this hand opening of welcome, what happens when there's people not in the church anymore? It's actually, this is actually highly relevant even before COVID because statistically people are leaving church or leaving church gatherings or leaving church worship service attendance. 
But notice that I'm not, I'm trying to go out of my way to say, to not, to not say that people are leaving church. Cause listen, and I've said this to many of you sitting in coffee shops, if this is you and you're one of those people that you're like, yeah, I left the church. Uh, you can't leave the church because you are the church, you see. So it's not actually about the building. But so this was happening before COVID. There were people leaving the church buildings saying that they left church, but you can't leave church if you are the church. But you can, in fact, leave the building. And now because of COVID, we have, in fact, left the building. And so this is how I am currently interpreting that piece of art at App State. People are leaving the building, and it's the hand of God that's catching them. The hand of God that's catching them on the way out. Church, listen. Church family, listen to me very clearly. Not all who wander are lost. Not all who leave a church building are lost. We know this because everyone has left the building now. Just about almost every church is outside of a church building at this point. And... This particular time, it's because the context of a church building is not safe from a medical, from a health perspective because of COVID. But there's also a lot of ways of interpreting this too. Over the years, there have been plenty of people who have said that the church did not feel like a safe place for them emotionally or spiritually. There's been emotional trauma associated with going to church. But people need a safe place to land and the unconditional love of God is like a hand that is always open that catches us when we leave the building. It's, it's demonstrated also in the way that we would love people to have our hands open just like God's hands are open because I think the kingdom of God is like one of these cities of refuge mentioned in Numbers and Deuteronomy. I think the kingdom of God is like a city of refuge. The kingdom of God is like one of these safe spaces, a place where the stranger is received in the, in the desert. This is not something that we're really accustomed to in our culture, are we? Right? That talking about desert practices in the middle of a, you know, a developed country with a lot of privilege and a lot of amenities. We're not used to the desert, are we? There's still something in a lot of us that even with COVID and everything being shut down and we're not supposed to be doing certain things, but we're trying to figure out how we can, can continue our society. We're not used to be being limited in any way, right? We jump to the, if we're out of olive oil, we jump to the grocery store and we get it right away. There's no thought of like having to grow all of the stuff and press the olive for that. We just, you just go to the store real quick and get some more. And if you run out of something, you just go and get it. And the, the, there's a lot of people in our country that feel that way. And it's just so important to realize that there are so many people both in our country and around the world that don't have those kind of privileges, that don't have those kind of amenities, that when food runs out, they don't just quickly go and get more. And so we kind of have this cultural understanding or this cultural misunderstanding where we feel entitled to have everything presented to us right when we want to have it. And so the idea of having a desert practice is very difficult for us because life in the desert is not like that. If you live in the middle of the desert, you find shelter, and we'll talk about a few other things over the next few weeks, but you don't run to the grocery store real quick when you run out of an item. You don't get to have everything that you want right when you want it. And so what COVID-19 has, has done in part is gotten us to a place where we are attempting to love people by staying distanced, and by wearing masks, but it's also done something else in us, if we're open to it, to kind of reevaluate the kind of world we want to live in and the kind of society we want to have and the way we want to treat people and the way that we want to love our neighbors and the way that we want to welcome people in our, into our homes. When's the last time you welcomed someone into your home? Has it been a while? Has it done anything in you? 
maybe to prepare your heart for the time that hopefully is coming sooner than later when we will be at a place where there's more safety and we what can you imagine how amazing your next dinner party is going to be with your friends do you know what I mean? Like, do you know the kind of hospitality that might kick in in your heart and your actions because we've been in the desert? And if we have an, we, if we capture this, we capture this opportunity to grasp something that's happening in the world and really learn some kind of lesson in our hearts to be the kind of people that that live out some of these practices that are that people that our mothers and fathers before us have experienced. Desert practices are not just for some other people at some other time, right? It's, it's for you and I right now. And so this is not super abstract, even though it is a bit abstract. We don't, we're not living, especially in Boone, we don't live in an actual desert. But I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I want to be at Disney World right now pretending that nothing has changed. But it did change. The world changed. And the church in America needs to admit it and respond with, in part, with what our mothers and fathers in the desert taught us about how to be in the desert instead of pretending that we aren't in the desert. Can we do that? Instead of, instead of pretending that we're not in a desert place, can we sit in the reality and admit that we are in the desert place because listen pretending to not be in the desert place and it leads to dying of thirst if we pretend that this isn't happening and we just kind of go about our business it's not going to go well for us in both uh, medical ways physical ways uh, mental health ways communal ways and so much more we need to be where we are and I think one of the ways we can do that is through our digital formation groups, digital spiritual formation groups. We have spiritual formation groups that some of you are in, and we're broadening this out now and calling it digital spiritual formation groups. It's kind of what it is anyway. But we also want to invite more and more people that are not even in Boone to be a part of that. We, uh, we have hosts, and we're going to be identifying more hosts that are going to be creating these safe spaces to be I mean, how wonderful it is it don't you think it's so wonderful to be able to have a safe space to be on your journey because our, our spiritual life our faith is like a journey through a desert sometimes isn't it and we're traveling through and we're not quite sure uh, where we're going sometimes and we're not and we, we know where we don't want to be but we're not quite sure where we want to be and things change and things ebb and flow and to have people to create safe spaces for the sake of our spiritual formation guiding us through specific topics books themes do you feel that like as a human being don't you feel how loving and powerful it is to offer safe place for someone to just be who they are? For years, we've been calling this love simple. And, and if you're not in a digital spiritual formation group or if you're not in a spiritual formation group and you would like to be in one of these, the, it's for the sake of eventually being in person to the best we can. But for now, let's admit that we're in the desert. Admit that we can't be in each other's living rooms or shouldn't be in each other's living rooms and embrace the, the opportunity that we have to be in the desert together as a community. There, there's a rule of St. Benedict. St. Benedict was a 6th century Italian monk and the rule of St. Benedict is so simple, it's so good and so applicable right now. And here it is. Let everyone that comes be received as Christ. Isn't that so good? Let everyone that comes be received as Christ. If you're in the desert, imagine this. If you're in the desert and you're in your monastery and someone arrives at your door, what do you do? 
Do you make them prove something about what they believe? Do they have to be the right kind of person from the right kind of tribe? Do they have to look a certain way? No, no, no. I think that if we were in the desert in a monastery or if we were just in a place that was remote and we knew that someone was on a long journey and they needed that safe space, when they arrived at our door, wouldn't we just assume them to be Christ, welcome them as Christ? I think this is very consistent with the teaching of Jesus when he said, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, etc." And they said, well, when did we do that? He said, whenever you did this for the least of my brothers, you've done it to me. I think that if we're in the, if we're in the desert and we're in the monastery or we're in, in, in a space and someone arrives, I think we assume them to be Christ and we treat them as such. Let everyone that comes be received as Christ. Can you imagine the kind of healing that can happen right now with all that's happening with our polarized society if when someone came to your door, someone came to your Zoom call, someone you, you were in the presence of someone in some way and you received them as Christ. The kind of healing that we could see in our culture, the kind of healing that we could see in our town, the kind of healing that we could see in our own hearts. There's an early uh, desert father, uh, Abba, which is actually a word that means father, Abba Zeno, and he was a 5th century Egyptian monk, and he says, he said this, if a man wants God to hear his prayer quickly, then before he prays anything else, even his own soul. So let me start over. If a man wants to hear his prayer, if, if a man wants God to hear his prayer quickly, then before he prays for anything else, even his own soul, when he stands and stretches out his hands towards God, he must pray with all his heart for his enemies. Let me read it again since I messed it up so bad. Abba Zeno, 5th century Egyptian monk. If a man wants God to hear his prayer quickly, then before he prays for anything else, even his own soul, when he stands and stretches out his hands toward God, he must pray with all his heart for his enemies. We need more safe spaces in our culture. This takes time. This takes commitment. This takes love. We can do it, though, but it takes us abiding in Christ together in this desert place. We are currently in a society with some empires and kingdoms that are actually claiming to have answers and are completely at odds with each other. But we actually, as sisters and brothers in Christ, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so that's kind of in a desert place, but the kingdom of heaven is like a city of asylum for people. And that when, when they come, we welcome them in as Christ. We can do this. And so here's the rare challenge from Jason. <laughs> it seems like a really cliche thing for pastors these days. And like, I just want to challenge you. But here it is. Here's a challenge for the next three months. Don't you think the next three months are pretty critical? in our culture for the next three months as a church family, as an extended church family, whether you're in Boone or wherever you are. I know there's people that we see on the, on the chat each week. There's people from all over. For the next three months, September, October, November, would you be willing to commit to share good things and share them often? Would you be willing to practice love? And then we can get through this storm, this polarized season, this desert place. Would you be willing to commit for the next three months, September, October, November, three months, just a season. And it's the season when things begin to fall away. Would you be willing to commit to share good things and share them often? And would you be willing to practice love 
so we can get through this storm, this polarized season together. Additionally, this is, this is continued in the challenge, <laughs> uh, within the context of the heart itself. So like what I'm talking about, about sharing good things just everywhere, online, where, in your relationships with people, in your places of work, but within the context of the heart, you know, we don't know how long we're going to be without a safe ability to meet in a building. We don't know how long that is. And so while we wait, while we continue to be online for our mobile, mobile church experience and have the chat feature, and as we continue to grow more digital spiritual formation groups and provide safe places for people of our church family to be on a journey together, but while we wait for the next in-person large group, would you be willing to would you be willing to be committed to love and pray for the pastors this and the staff and the ministry leadership team of the heart would you pray for us as we pray for you and would you do the same for the people in your d- digital spiritual formation groups and would you do the same for yourself and so It's a lot of a challenge there, but here it all is again. For the next three months, share good things, share them often, commit to practicing love so we can get through this storm together. And additionally, within the context of the heart, would you be willing to be committed to praying for the pastors, staff, and ministry leadership team of the Heart Church family and be praying for the people in your digital spiritual formation groups And would you be willing to be in prayer for yourself? Because my sisters and my brothers, we need to be kind to ourselves during this time as well. So, may you love God. And may you love your neighbors. And may you love your enemies. And may you love those that are fleeing in the desert because they have become accidental murderers. And may you love them. And may you come to find that one of the reasons why it is good to love them is because when you love them, you are loving yourself. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and shine his light on you and grant you with peace. And I'll close this morning's teaching with a a quote from a 13th century poet. There's a 13th century poet from Afghanistan named Rumi. That was one of his names. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about.